is taken care of, I'd like to say good morning. Our scripture reading for the morning comes from Romans chapter 7. And in this chapter, Paul discusses how sin affects the Christian life, even through a mature Christian, how sin still affects our lives. And so I want to start there this morning, and we're going to start with our scripture reading. It comes from Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Romans 7, 14 says this, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, and that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now I do, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, and I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I read that verse about a hundred times trying to get the do's and do nots and the wants and wills and everything else figured out, and I still think I messed it up. But anyways, so Paul has this ver th these words written down, and at first glance it looks like he's just rambling on and on about this what I want to do and what I can't do and all this other stuff. But I think it's important because there's a rumor that goes around in Christian circles that once you become a Christian, somehow all your problems are over, somehow you're no longer tempted to sin, that you can lead this perfect life, that if you're a true believer, God is going to shelter you from this sorrow and suffering. But that's that's not true. I wish it was. But here, not even the Apostle Paul. Here he is a mature Christian. A man that has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. A man we would consider a model Christian by most standards. And yet he says, I am not free of sin. It still lingers. It's, I still want to do it at times. The consequences of sin are over. He says that if you believe in Christ, the consequences are over for sin. Satan's teeth have been removed, and yet he still feels pulled to commit these sins. And here Paul is, He's lamenting over this fact that he cannot live a perfect life. That he continues to struggle with sin. And he's lamenting over it. And now lamenting is a word we don't use very often. But we have an entire book in the Old Testament, Lamentations. And it's 
All lamenting is, is your, it's a really passionate grief that you have. It's a, a real intense sorrow. In the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations, he is expressing this passionate grief that Israel is lost. Jerusalem had fallen. And here we see Paul, he's doing the exact same thing about he, how he just cannot escape sin. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh. The Holy Spirit's within him. His soul is saved, and yet his physical body still has passions and desires that pull him to sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I just keep doing. Paul is addicted to sin. And when I say addicted, that's exactly what I mean. He wants to stop. He knows what's right. And he still does it anyways. If you've been watching the news, Tammy and I, we watch the news every night. There's a huge opioid epidemic going on in our nation. Right now, there's an estimated 2.1 million people addicted to opioids. That's pain medication, basically. They're addicted to opioids, and they want to stop, and they can't. If you know anyone that's been addicted to a drug or alcohol or tobacco, whatever it is, many times if they want to stop, they'll tell you, I want to stop, but I just can't. I hate what I'm doing, but I can't stop it. Every Christian must realize we are also addicted to sin. We continually sin. We may know what God wants us to do, and yet we can't do it all the time. Maybe we wake up in the morning and we say, we're going to take the letter that James wrote in the church, and we're going to take that very seriously, and we're going to control our tongues. We wake up, we walk out, we stub our toe, and guess what? Our tongue comes loose. But then we start doing better, we eat breakfast, and we go on, and we head to work, and a guy cuts us off in traffic, and there goes our tongue again. But, you know, we finally make it to work, we get in our office, we sit down, we think it's all good, and then a co-worker or a customer or a boss comes in and they say something and it's like, boom, there's your tongue going again. We know what we're supposed to do, but we can't do it. We're addicted to sin. But like any good addict, like any good addict, we're going to deny we have a problem. We don't have that problem. I can stop anytime I want to. But this is Paul saying, no, look, I have a problem and I'm going to admit it. I'm addicted. I cannot live a sinless life even though I have committed my life to Christ. Again, like a good addict, even after we realize we're addicted to something, we downplay this. We downplay it and we go, well, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. Surely he wasn't doing anything that bad. He couldn't have been doing that, anything that bad. We know what his life looks like from his letters. I mean, he wasn't out there murdering people. He wasn't out there raping women, you know. What possibly could he be doing? I mean, did he tell the little white lie? Is that what we're talking about? But even that little white lie, even that most minor infraction should send the most sincere believer to their knees, asking forgiveness, realizing 
that we messed up and we cannot live this perfect life. But you know, I know, I know Christians, I've talked to a lot, of, I talk a lot to people, and they say, well, once I became a Christian, I just, I don't sin anymore. I'm a mature Christian, I don't do it anymore. Or they say, well, you know, I, I used to sin. Even as a Christian, I used to sin. But it's gotten so rare now that when I do sin, I just go, oh, my goodness, where did that come from? Because it only happens, you know, once a week or once a month, you know, something like that. We want to downplay how addicted we really are here. But Paul is portraying this as a daily battle that he faces, and he loses it a lot of times. I mean, if you listen to Paul, he's like, you know, I'm sinning all the time, but I don't want to. There's another big name in Christianity, especially if you're a Protestant. Protestant basically just means you're not Catholic and you're not Eastern Orthodox. If you're not that, you're Protestant. That's basically the, how that sums up. But Martin Luther, 500 years ago, started what's known as the Protestant Reformation. And so I, I got a story. I want to tell you about how he feels about sin and how, in, how embedded sin is in our lives. So Martin Luther, he's on his way to be a lawyer, and he gets caught out in a lightning storm. And it says that lightning struck so close to him that it actually blew him back, and he fell down. And he cries out, St. Anna! If you get me through this storm, I will become a monk. Now, I can't imagine being stuck in a lightning storm and that phrase comes out of my mouth. But that's what he says he said. And so he gets through the storm. And he fears God and says, I made a commitment. I'm going to go be a monk. So he goes and he becomes a monk. He lives in a monastery. And as he's there, part of being a monk, part of being in this monastery is each night you had to go to your confessor and confess all your sins from the last 24 hours. And so each night he would go in and he'd confess his sins. 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. In fact, his confessor says there were a couple times he was in there three hours confessing his sins from the last 24-hour period. And he's a monk living in a monastery. How much trouble can you get in? But three hours he is confessing his sins because he realized what God's will was and he knew he wasn't living up to what he should be doing. I don't know, I think of that story and I go, I'm not sure what he did. Did he look at someone's plate and say, oh, he had more food than me, and so I'm coveting his food. I don't know how you come up with three hours worth of confessing, but that's what he did because he realized how sinful human nature really was. Paul goes on and in verse 21, he says, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Now I know, I know a few alcoholics. I don't call them former alcoholics because they don't like that term. They're always alcoholics even if they don't drink anymore. And so I know a couple alcoholics. I know a couple people that have stopped smoking. Maybe you do as well. And they'll tell you years after the fact, having never smoked for years, having never drank for years, the desire is still there. That fear, that temptation is still there to go back. And that's what Paul is saying. That evil lies close at hand. Even when we think we're on the straight and narrow, that temptation is right there beside us. And so my wife told me this story a few times, and I think it's pretty important for us. I think it's a good analogy, at least. So this woman gets this little snake as a pet and has it for years and years. And it's a python. And it grows and grows. And she realizes this python's not acting right. There's something not quite right with it. And so what she does is 
the ra this radio program, there's a veterinarian on the line, and you can call in and ask your questions and stuff like that. And so this woman calls in and asks the veterinarian, says, hey, I have an issue. I've had this python on for years and years, and it has slept in my bed with me for years and years, and it just be curled up in a big, you know, a snake thing, you know, it's just curled up, and it sit at my feet. But these last three or four nights, it's stretched out long next to me instead of curled up like it used to be. What's going on? And the veterinarian says, you need to get rid of the snake tonight. That snake is measuring to see if it's big enough to swallow you. And as I, I think of this, I go, this is the perfect Christian analogy. We have the serpent. Genesis 3, the fall. We have the serpent laying next to us, measuring us, waiting for us to relax, and it's going to swallow us whole. That's what Paul's saying. Evil is there ready to strike whenever we're most vulnerable. And so Paul cries out, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul and Martin Luther and every Christian must realize that we do not have the strength to overcome sin on our own. It will be a lifelong journey and we will continue to sin. We cannot just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and get over it. That's not how this works. The only deliverance that we have is thanks to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now I'm one, I'm, I stand up here all the time and I say, you know, Christ was the standard and that's what we should be striving for. I've said it many times. And I firmly believe that's how we should live our lives. But Paul's saying we have to also realize we can't do it. We cannot live that perfect standard. We will fall continually over and over. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But when we do fall, what it means is we have to recognize it. Ask for forgiveness. Try to learn from it. And move on. We cannot just continue to dwell on our sins. Because the battle the war has already been won. Christ Jesus won our battle 2,000 years ago. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. And yet we're going to lose a lot of these skirmishes that's going on in our lives. We'll continue to sin. But we need to strive to continue to live the Christ-like life. But when we do fail, we need to just recognize it, ask forgiveness, and move on. Thanks to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, thank you so much for this wonderful day and all the blessings you've given us. As we go throughout this week, we ask you to be with us and give us the strength to avoid sin, Lord. But when we do sin, we ask you to make it be made known to us. And we ask you for our forgiveness, Lord. Let us study your word so we know exactly what sin is and how sinful we are. And when we fall short, Lord, that we come to you in humbleness. Knowing we cannot do it on our own, but the war has been won. The outcome has been assured. Thanks to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.